Daniel Bohannon, and uh, today is one of the security talks, um, particularly looking at PowerShell uh, and the, the really, really fascinating uh, and uh, useful visibility that it gives us, um, especially from the defensive side of the security world of looking at uh, how does it really help us investigate attacks that at some point leverage some aspect of PowerShell. Um, and then it's also kind of going to be like a buffet. Uh, of, of some of the in-the-wild PowerShell um, that we see used by attackers. Um, so hopefully you'll find it uh, interesting uh, in at least one of those regards. Um, so I, I'm a security researcher for FireEye. Um, I ha have an obsession with PowerShell um, even before I got into security. Um, and I really like, uh, in the world of security, I like writing uh, detection stuff, but I also really like looking at obfuscation and evasion and seeing from a syntactic level how can a language be used to evade how it's normally used so an attacker can achieve uh, their goals. So for this talk, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction, and then we're going to dive right into some in-the-wild examples uh, of seeing uh, some cases in which PowerShell has been used uh, for malicious purposes. Um, and along the way, we're going to look at a few uh, kind of forensic artifacts uh, and detection approaches that we take uh, with this data and with this information to help uh, both ourselves as well as our customers and clients be able to be more informed about detecting uh, the malicious uh, usage that we'll be looking at here. Um, and then we'll dive into the awesomeness of PowerShell logging, um, primarily uh, module, script lock, and transcription logging, um, and kind of look at that in the context uh, of some of these uh, different attack approaches to really see the value proposition of enabling this, uh, this logging in PowerShell. And then at the end, uh, we'll talk just about a few, a little more novel uh, detection approaches with some of these artifacts, uh, and then we'll look at some key takeaways. So with that, let's dive right into the intro. So I've been in IT for nine years now. Uh, I didn't start in security. I started uh, like a server database admin, almost an apprentice, I would say. Um, and then I got into security uh, after that. Um, and so for me personally, two things have remained consistent across uh, the, the different jobs that I've had. One is an obsession with coffee, if you notice that from the first slide. Uh, and second is uh, really trying to get better and better at PowerShell. Um, and to kind of evangelize that internally um, because it's super, super nice to be able to speak the same language and to know, hey, let's talk about pipelines. And that's why I love this conference is because I learned so much because most of my world is in studying how attackers use PowerShell, which is very, very limited because they want everything to work in PowerShell 2 because that's going to be the lowest common denominator. So when I come here, there's all this amazing stuff about PowerShell that I've never even heard of, and so it's awesome. This is the conference that I, that I learned the most at when it comes to my PowerShell knowledge, so uh, super excited to be, to be back again after last year. So when I started using PowerShell, it was to automate stuff before I even got into security. But then when I got into security, I was fascinated by how attackers were using PowerShell. And what was their motive? Why, why did they go to PowerShell? And, and there's so many different um, open source offensive frameworks um, that ethical pen testers use and publish that attackers will also commandeer and use for their purposes. So on our team at FireEye, on the advanced practices team, uh, we're responsible for kind of tracking these behaviors and these techniques and these methodologies uh, and using that to, to tie to different uh, threat groups that use them, um, but then also developing detections to detect this kind of technique and, and, uh, and usage. So when we look at some of the in-the-wild samples here, you're going to notice a lot of these are not sophisticated at all, right? Sophistication can mean a lot of different things, but sometimes simpler is better. Um, and so a lot of people will say, oh, well, like, that's stupid. That can't really be how simple it is that some attackers you know, will do just that. And the reality is, it's like, well, yeah, sometimes it actually is quite simple. Now, sure, you have, you have this smaller number of really good uh, hackers and threat actors that do some insanely just beautifully creative stuff. But for the most part, an attacker is not going to take that next step and burn that tradecraft unless they have to. So if what works today will still work tomorrow, they're not going to change it. Then we'll look at, uh, for each of these kinds of evolutions of, of methodologies and techniques, we'll look at uh, defensive artifacts, or forensic artifacts and detection techniques um, that, we find help, that we have found helpful and that others have found helpful as well. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe in this talk, you'll kind of look at some different ways of looking at the same data to really get a different outcome in terms of looking for uh, m malicious usage or just abnormal usage in your environment. And this is where it's really awesome because um, from, a, from a consulting perspective, uh, we have to have detection ideas that work across hundreds of very, very different environments. And we can't go to them and say, hey, you need to stop doing this thing. 
Um, however, if, if you're the person that has that visibility in your environment, then you actually have a really privileged seat at the table to be able to help influence change. By no means is it easy. I, I definitely realize that it's a difficult thing to do, but to be able to, to kind of sell the, pro the value proposition of upgrading to PowerShell 5 at least and enabling this logging and all this stuff. And so I'd encourage you to hopefully not be uh, 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 frustrated or, or downtrodden by how hard some of this stuff is, um, but just taking one step at a time and, and kind of being able to see it incrementally get better. Um, also, for PowerShell logging, uh, if you haven't read, um, that my colleague Matt Dunwoody has this blog post, Greater Visibility Through PowerShell, uh, and then also uh, the, the Microsoft's uh, PowerShell Hearts the Blue Team, two amazing, amazing resources. And one caveat I want to say is that this talk will only be looking at a detection perspective of some of these uh, uh, visibility um, improvements in PowerShell. Uh, I won't be talking at all about preventative measures like GIA uh, and constrained language mode. And so I know Lee Holmes has given some awesome talks on that. So everything that we're talking about today is purely detection. Um, but it, there are so many more reasons to get to later versions of PowerShell and actually flip some of these switches to enable the stuff. It's really, really good. So for this talk, it's going to be like a ride along. So for me, all day, every day, I'm looking at malicious code. I'm looking at attacker activity. Um, and so I'm inviting you guys to jump on board and check this out, except instead of cruising the streets, we're going to be cruising some code and seeing exactly how this is done in the wild. So let's get right to it. Example number one, or array item zero. This is infuriatingly simple, but it is extremely prevalent, and that is PowerShell being used just to download an executable. All right. Now, now why, do I, why do I start with this example? Well, there, over the years, have been many, many reports by security vendors that talk about the crazy rise in PowerShell attacks. And it's honestly led to a lot of paranoia by people uh, who maybe don't understand the, the technical levels of how that report came to be. And they say, oh, well, we obviously need to disable PowerShell because it's bad because attackers love it. Uh, when in reality, how many of those attacks are just a glorified curl command, right? So, so we have to kind of take a step back. And when we see those numbers, it's like, okay, is this a PowerShell problem? Or just the fact that everyone in this organization can just run arbitrary macros, right? And PowerShell happened to be the curl of choice that the attacker used. Anyways, I digress. So this is a real in the wild command. So a little function here that's going to download a file into this temp 5130.exe, uh, and they're going to pass in an array of a few different domains, and whichever one successfully is able to, to reach out and download that file, um, then they'll execute that file. That's all it is. Pretty lame, right? Except they don't have it in nice, beautified code. They smash it all into a single line, and they have a couple inline comments in there when you actually see it run um, on the command line. And then, when that stops working, when detections start to catch up a little bit, they'll then say, OK, well, if you're looking for this syntax on the command line, maybe instead we'll take that command, and then we'll gzip, compress it, and then we'll base64 encode it. And then what you see on the command line now as an attacker is this. right? So in the dark gray, you have your base64 encoded version. And so the yellow is going to base64 decode. And then outside of that, you have the wrapper to deflate that stream, store it in this variable s, which at the end, you'll then have uh, be decompressed and then executed by IEX. Now, if we don't have any of PowerShell's logging enabled, then we're actually likely stuck with having to write detections for the underlying code and the earlier revisions, but then also all these extra wrappings, right? Now, that can get uh, very cumbersome very quickly. Next example, PowerShell in your environment. Um, so this is looking at uh, introducing uh, another binary MSHTA into the mix uh, for this chain. Uh, and this is actually from a blog post uh, from, uh, from Dave Kennedy uh, with uh, Binary Defense. And, uh, and so this is where the sample is taken from. It's actually a nice uh, blog post to read if you're interested in this uh, kind of chain of attack. Um, but attackers realize, you know what, uh, defenders are, are detecting download string or download file on the command line, and we've gone through and we started to, to gzip it and encode it, but attackers are writing detections against that decoding syntax and the decompressing syntax. Um, so maybe we'll just keep our payload completely off the command line. And then all you see is PowerShell invoking some random environment variable. Well, when you look at the execution of that process, you can see the parent process is mshta.exe which is the Microsoft HTML application host for Internet Explorer. Um, and attackers love using MSHTA um, for uh, .hta files. But in this case, what they're doing is they're running inline JavaScript right on the command line with MSHTA. Now, that JavaScript is it's extracting a value from this registry path, 
And then it is a directly evaling that value in the green you can see there. Now, that means that there's a good chance that since JavaScript is evaling, that whatever's in that registry key is also more JavaScript. And the attacker can chain as many of those jumps from one key to the next to get the next layer of likely obfuscated JavaScript. And at some point in one of those layers, that JavaScript will set that random environment variable GKWA. And then at that point, it will then spawn the child process of PowerShell to reference that variable. However, it's going to be a process level environment variable, which means it's not backed in registry. It's just available to that session and any uh, descendants of that session. So from a defender's perspective, what that means is, well, now the, the, the ground truth is spread in a couple different places, right? Now we have to go back and look. Uh, we have to get, go to that system, grab this regi the registry key, look at the contents, and maybe the contents have already been deleted, right? So now at that point, well, crap, what, what code was there? What actually ran? Again, we'll see later, is that with PowerShell logging, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Example number three, PowerShell in your environment? This one's kind of fun because attackers started doing the MSHTA stuff where all you see is this IEX variable. But then defenders realize, well, it's really uncommon for me to ever see that on the command line and it be legitimate, right? So they started to write detections on PowerShell IEX environment variable. But then attackers would come back and do something functionally equivalent like this. Um, and so uh, this code was actually produced by an obfuscation framework called Invoke Obfuscation that I worked on a couple years ago. And it functionally, it actually does the exact same thing. IEX is represented by this code, or the environment variable is represented by this code, and then IEX is represented by this code. So let's break this down real quick. For the IEX part, uh, the environment variable comspec with PowerShell, tick marks can be excluded from environment variables, so we'll just pull those straight out. The, when you actually expand uh, comspec, whether you're expanding it from PowerShell or command, it's 27 characters long, and it's the full path to cmd.exe. So now what's happening in the rest of this command is they're treating it as an array and saying, you know what, the fourth, the 15th, and the 25th characters are i, e, and x. And then they're joining it on nothing, which produces the string i, e, x, and then they're invoking it with the dot operator, which is functionally the same as the commandlet i, e, x. That sucks, right? Like, that's really cool, in my opinion. Um, but it stinks for defenders to have to figure out, oh, crap, well, that's, you know, that's actually invocation right there. Uh, well, let's look at the, the, the rest of it here. Um, this dash F format operator uh, is, is really interesting um, when it comes to obfuscation because basically what we can see here is that it allows you to have an array of items on the right side that can then be transposed uh, and replace the curly brace index on the left side of that string. So what it means is that we need to actually reorder that, which is going to, in memory, be the string environment. And then we're doing a direct uh, typecast, which we can replace just as uh, environment in square brackets as the, the type itself. And then SV is short for set variable. And then as you can see, OK, that actually lines up with the next command, where it's, uh, it's actually get variable, but get dash is implied uh, automatically when you type a command. So you don't actually don't have to ever use get dash. So like child item is get child item, right? Um, so variable is get variable. And then the tack VA is short for uh, value only, because any substring between V and value only will work for that uh, parameter binding for get variable. So what that means is that environment, we can just drop right down into that second part of the code, like just, just walking through in our heads, right? So now that environment is calling something, which is two more instances of this F format operator. So let's reorder those. And now I see get environment variable and process embedded in a couple layers of strings. And this dot invoke is only required in PowerShell 2. Uh, for the method invocation, it's not required in PowerShell 3 or later. But anyways, let's change those from string objects to actually what they should be, which is environment, get environment variable, specifying that GKWA, and saying this is a process level environment variable. So that's functionally how all that translates. Whew. All right. So, <laughs> so those are three examples of, of things. That, I, I don't want to call it commodity because a lot of commodity malware uses these little tricks, but just because a trick is used doesn't mean that it's always commodity. You still have to look at exactly what code is actually being run, what is the context, who's running it, um, to understand you know, uh, what level of concern you should have, I guess is one way of putting it. So the last three examples we're going to look at uh, are uh, open source frameworks um, that are RATs, or remote access tools, or, or backdoors. People have a lot of different names we'll kind of throw around for them. Um, the first one is called Crack Map Exec, um, written by a guy named Marcelo. And it's actually uh, the stitching together of three separate open source tools, CredCrack, SMB Map, and SMB Exec. 
So now when you see crack map exec today, it looks something like this. PowerShell is going to run. Um, it's going to be launched by WMI PRVSE, which is going to be uh, WMI. Um, and so uh, you'll actually notice the first part looks really familiar, right? It's that same comspec trick, which is IEX. But then what's going on with the rest of it here? The rest of the payload is ASCII encoding and then casting it to a char array and then casting it to a string and joining it back together with nothing. So essentially uh, getting it out, for, uh, converting it from ASCII characters to uh, plain text. And it's going to resolve to something like this. So in this code, the first portion is a try catch block, which is an, an AMSI, AMSI bypass. So AMSI is the anti malware scanning interface. Uh, from Microsoft that allows any registered AV vendors to, to, to talk to that interface, not just for PowerShell code, but for several other scripting languages, but essentially the, the value and all the visibility that we're going to see that comes from PowerShell script block loggings, AMZ then gives any registered AV vendor the opportunity to look at that at every level and then make a block, no block decision on every layer of unwrapping, which is really cool, except when an attacker comes in and says, yeah, I'm just going to turn that off. And this is one such AMZ bypass that's kind of been uh, passed around uh, and, and, and modified. Um, now, the important thing to note here is that this will disable it um, only for the current session. And it's actually funny because AMZ bypasses that worked a couple months ago are getting flagged as malicious content now. So attackers are continually having to, to kind of tweak and tune and try to find ways around that initial instance. One thing I'd say, though, is that attackers really almost never have to do this because a lot of times uh, PowerShell 2 will still be installed on the system, which means the attacker can just run PowerShell 2, and that doesn't have any of the, the, the awesome visibility that later versions of PowerShell engines have. Um, but attackers want to make sure that no matter what, their code runs. So that's why they always are going to throw, in this case, they're always going to try to do that if it exists. Which becomes an interesting detection opportunity, right? Because let's say 9 out of 10 systems an attacker and environment runs this on don't even have uh, script lock locking or uh, AMSI, right? But then if the attacker is still running it, that gives me 10 opportunities to detect it. Next, uh, they are uh, disabling uh, the SSL cert validation check because they're going to be uh, performing a remote download cradle um, on another system inside the environment that they've already compromised. Um, without a valid SSL certificate. So in this case, they're downloading a, a credential dumping tool called Invoke Mimikatz, which is a PowerShell implementation of the credential, the credential dumping tool Mimikatz. Um, and then they are invoking Mimikatz with some different uh, parameters there and storing that in the CMD variable. Now, the very last step is that they're then posting those results back to the same internal C2. Now, sometimes we'll see attackers running this, uh, and, and you'll see this command run on their target systems, and they'll be posting the results back to typically one source system that the attacker um, is running. But sometimes you'll see this run on like 100 systems at once, and there's mass remotely executing this and then getting creds just flying back to them um, for any credentials that Mimikatz is able to extract. However, uh, if I go back a couple slides, the, the, the code didn't always look like this. Uh, before, it was just the plain text on the command line. Um, but as that started to be detected, then he implemented an ASCII encoding in PowerShell, or uh, he wrote this tool in Python. Um, but so you can kind of, again, see the evolution over time as the tool uh, will actually change. Next example is Empire. Um, so uh, any of you that have been here over the past several years know uh, Will Schroeder, uh, super awesome dude, and he wrote Empire. Uh, and so with Empire, it's a full uh, PowerShell implementation of, uh, of a rat. Um, and so kind of the out-of-the-box empire that you'll see today is going to look like this. It's just a PowerShell encoded command. Um, and so if we decode that, then we see a nice, very warm, inviting piece of code that looks like this. So let's clean this up so we can make sense of what it's doing. And I'm going to kind of break it up into two, two chunks. So the first chunk, uh, we'll see a very similar uh, deal where it's going to say, hey, if you're PowerShell 3 or later, there's a chance you're going to have some really awesome visibility turned on. So now let's go and try to disable script lock logging script lock invocation logging, and at the very end, a very, very similar AMSI bypass that we saw on the last tool. The next big chunk of code uh, is going to be uh, setting uh, the default web proxy, the default ne network credentials, setting up the UA string and all that stuff. Um, and then in the, the dark gray here, I've actually uh, kind of made this code a little prettier up in this box. This is an RC4 uh, decryption uh, uh, routine. So uh, with Empire, uh, he built it so that it would be uh, much more cryptographically sound than, than some other tools that were being used. And so this is the RC4 uh, routine right there. Um, and then the, the last portion is actually downloading the code from the remote source and then running it. So now, let's say as a defender, 
um, if, let's say we review our logs every day, right? And every day we go in. So tomorrow I come into the work, I'm reviewing these logs, and I see, and I, I have detections for PowerShell for this kind of empire activity. Well, okay, that, that, that's not good. Now let me go and figure out what the payload actually was. Well, it's convenient um, because we know right where the payload was being hosted, right? Well, what if the attacker's already taken that down? So in this case, it's an internal uh, IP address, uh, .13.37, for a little inside joke there. Um, but typically, that's going to be an external IP address. And so if the attacker's already taken that payload down, then now what, what, what do I have to go on? Well, if we had PowerShell logging enabled, uh, then we'd actually have a bit more to go off of. Because it wouldn't matter if that external payload still existed, just like it wouldn't matter in the previous example if the contents of that registry still existed. If the payload was invoked in PowerShell, then we're going to have it in PowerShell logs. And hopefully those logs are being shipped off of that endpoint to a centralized server so that afterwards, even if the attacker clears the local event logs, you still have them externally. The very last one we'll look at is a commercial tool called Cobalt Strike. Um, often we'll see it being launched by a service, um, either locally or remotely, uh, to run it as a system level user. Um, and th th this first part is interesting. So, Typically, people will detect like, malicious service usage by monitoring for the system event logs uh, 7045 event ID, which is for service creation. We do it as well, but that's not the only way that we do it, because if you modify an existing service, it does not create a 7045 event. Um, and so some really good attackers will just modify an existing service to something malicious, run it, and then modify it back. Or they'll create a new benign service and then immediately modify it, run the modified version, and then modify it back to the benign service. So another way you can go about monitoring this is looking in the current control set services registry key and look for the image path. And there's actually a few paths you'll want to look for in there, another one being failure commands or a DLL path as well. Um, but uh, when this is set in the services registry key, oftentimes I'll use that command.exe version of comspec variable. So the percent comspec percent. Um, which will resolve to command, and then the start beam in PowerShell. Now, this is used because typically when a service runs, the service binary, after it starts up, will send a message back and say, hey, services, I'm running, I'm good, just to let you know my state, it's good. So that way, when you look at services, it'll say, hey, this service is running. Well, this is not a service binary. And so after 30 seconds, there's, this PowerShell code is never going to send a service message back and be like, I'm running. So services is going to say, hey, this service timed out, and it's going to kill the process that it started. Well, in this case, instead of killing PowerShell, it's going to kill command, because that start bmin is, is command launching PowerShell uh, on, its, on its own thread so that when command is killed, PowerShell still runs. And this actually burned me uh, when I was uh, first learning uh, incident response because I saw these failure messages, and I'm like, ha-ha, silly attacker, his code didn't run. It's timing out. But then my uh, colleague uh, very, very nicely told me that I was very wrong and showed me uh, why that was. So can't always believe everything that you read in logs. Context is important, I guess, is the key there. Um, so if we decode this encoded command, we'll see something like this. All right? And it actually looks very similar to some early examples. Um, where we have our, our, uh, our payload is going to be base64 decoded. It's then going to be decompressed and actually stored in the same variable s. It's just a lot of uh, commonalities there. A lot of uh, copy and pasting in the security world, as with IT. And then it's going to decompress and then invoke that with IEX there at the end. So once it's actually decompressed, uh, then here's what the code looks like. Uh, and it's redacted just because it's so large otherwise. But basically, um, you have this uh, here string called, in the variable called do it. That's just the, what the, the code produces. You're going to have two functions that are going to be related to uh, loading the shell code directly in the memory. And that shell code will be stored in this var code variable. Um, and then at the end, it's going to uh, execute that here string uh, do it content. Uh, and it's going to basically ask, um, am I on a 64 or 32 bit system? So in this case, this was a 32 bit payload generated by Cobalt Strike. And that's where that int pointer size is going to help the code decide, am I on a 32 bit system or 64 bit? And if I'm on a 64 bit system, since I have a 32 bit payload, I need to use the start job commandlet in PowerShell to then properly use the, the run as 32 flag to run 32 bit. Now, some attackers are clever, and they won't run this uh, payload out of PowerShell.exe because they realize a lot of people are looking for executions of PowerShell.exe. So maybe they'll actually rename PowerShell. Or maybe they'll be running unmanaged PowerShell injected into another process. What a lot of attackers don't realize is that if they're continually sticking with 32-bit payloads because it's the lowest common denominator, then when they hit this and if they ever run 
or if they're running on a 64-bit system with that 32-bit payload, start job is actually going to spawn a new PowerShell process. And it does not matter the name of the process in which this code is running. Start job will run PowerShell.exe every single time with some very specific arguments. Um, and so there have been some really good detection approaches based just on that alone. Not foolproof, but every little bit helps. So do it is a, a common uh, meme or jab in the, the IR community when it comes to Cobalt Strike. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to use that meme. Whew. OK, so six samples in. Um, that's, that, that, that's just a, a really brief kind of broad overview of some of the kinds of things that we see. And again, you may be very unimpressed by that. And honestly, like a lot of attackers are very successful using unimpressive techniques. But it comes into the culmination of how they're using these that actually becomes quite, uh, quite interesting. So let's look at some, uh, a little bit more at some forensic artifacts and detection approaches here. Um, when it comes to detecting malicious attacks in general, not even just PowerShell, like at a bare minimum, having process execution logs is so, so important. Typically, people will get that from security event log 4688, or uh, they might go a, a second route and use the Sysmon uh, EID1. Um, for things like service creation we talked about, that's going to be a, uh, a system um, Sorry, it's security event log 4688, system secure, uh, uh, EID 7045. Um, but then when it comes to PowerShell, like, we should also be looking at all the, the insane logging that PowerShell has at our disposal. And then some other places we'll look at are like monitoring like registry keys for common persistence locations, um, WMI repositories, startup folders on disk, um, just, just to name a few. Another thing we'll do is look at parent-child process relationships, right? So remember CrackMap exec when it's running all those remote commands? Well, that's WMI PRVSE directly launching PowerShell. Now, there are plenty of legitimate tools that do that, but in your environment, you can tune those things out, uh, and maybe it's actually very uncommon, and so that becomes a very interesting thing to start to key off of. Um, other categories would be um, like Office, um, you know, Microsoft Office, uh, or Adobe Acrobat Reader, or Outlook, or Opera, or Thunderbird launching PowerShell directly. Again, we do see it happen legitimately sometimes, but you can start to kind of baseline in my environment how often would I see a web server process, or a database process, or a middleware stack launching PowerShell, or launching command slash C and then PowerShell, or something like that. Now, uh, parent processes um, can be uh, tricked. Um, in, so like with Cobalt Strike, there's a, a, a way now where you can basically set the parent PID to be any existing process that you want. So there's always ways to fool um, those sorts of things, but again, it still is a very valuable uh, detection approach. Another thing we can do is if we know that there are certain PowerShell um, syntaxes that a lot of attackers will use because copy and paste is easy, if we know a combination of this gzip decompression as well as base64 uh, decoding from, from base64 string is really common, um, then why don't I look for those combinations of things literally anywhere I can think of? So maybe I'll look, instead of just looking for some of the known registry key persistence locations, I'll look across the whole registry or across all the, 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 the BAT and VBS files on disk or something like that, um, or even public repositories like VirusTotal, right? Um, and so we can start to kind of codify stuff we know about attackers and look everywhere for that to find new variations. And there's other places that we can look for known stuff, like network traffic um, and, uh, and things like that. We've had a lot of uh, success in just looking for known combinations of file or of uh, language patterns um, in places that we'd never even think would be possible to see it. And after sometimes a few months of waiting, you'll get that hit. And it's like, oh, that was actually, that was time well spent. Cool. The lesson there is that sometimes success looks like three months of failure. <laughs> it looks like I spent eight hours on this idea to get it uh, optimized enough to run, and then three months of nothing. But that's why you put out like 100 ideas over the you know, course of a couple weeks or a couple months. And then three months down the line, when one or two of those start to hit, you realize, OK, there's, there's value here. So. The real value in all of this, specifically in talking about PowerShell, is in the visibility that PowerShell logging gives us. So when you look at PowerShell logging and the amount of logs that are available compared to other languages, it's pretty insane. Um, and sometimes you can get overwhelmed. So <laughs> when you start to open your eyes to all the data that's available in PowerShell logging, you've got to be careful, right? Especially if you're piping everything into a sim where you have to pay by the gig index or something like that. 
But some people will look at that and say, well, clearly this is why we shouldn't enable this logging. And that's where the answer becomes, well, how do you do proper filtering or how do you start small? How do you start with saying, I want to uh, capture this, uh, these events and this is what I want to do with these events and here's the kinds of attacks we can uh, detect based on this data. So the three main categories of PowerShell logging are module logging, script lock logging, and transcription logging. And the first one is kind of like a stepbrother we're gonna look at, which is like over the shoulder logging transcription. Um, and the reason I call it a stepbrother is because it's not actually in the event log, there's this one example, but it's this PS read line console host. Um, now I was just in, uh, I think it was Anthony's talk on PS read line, which freaking blew my mind. I had no idea PS read line was so awesome. So definitely check that talk out uh, when, when uh, the recordings are published. But essentially, from my perspective as an, as an IR, an incident response uh, defender, is whenever an interactive session is opened in PowerShell 3 or later, and you type a command and hit enter, it's going to be written to this text file, console host history, in the app data of the current user. Now, that's, that's basically all that's written in there. And it, so it allows you that if you exit that session and then a month later open up a new PowerShell session, even though if you type git history, if you don't see any histories in that session, you can just type the up arrow and it will retrieve the last log, uh, uh, the commands that were in this text file. Awesome for usability. Now, uh, uh, attackers all, uh, who know about this file love going after it because they can uh, then see, oh my goodness, someone did convert to secure string uh, at, you know, as plain text and there's a password sitting in their console host file. However, defenders also like this because some attackers don't know about this file. So if they're doing interactive PowerShell, they may clear the event logs but completely forget about this one. <clears throat> So if we run git command asterisk yoda asterisk, and there's, uh, there's not going to be anything. And so if we try to run invoke yoda, there's nothing there, right? So those are the two commands that, will, because we're in an interactive session, will go into that uh, text file. But the real transcription logging uh, is going to look like this. It's going to give you timestamps, the users, the current working directories, the machine name, the, the, the PowerShell versions, like an insane amount of information. And then we're actually going to see both the input and the standard output runs. So we actually see the full uh, error message in that transcription log. Now that's really useful. And it's useful because what if an attacker is, uh, is doing directory listing and then uh, you know, zipping up an entire directory's worth of contents? Well now you can actually literally see the output of git child item and see what are all the files that just got zipped up and walked out of my environment. Um, this information is also going to be stored in module logs in both the, the uh, Windows PowerShell event log EID 800 as well as the operational PowerShell log in EID 4103. There's a very small nuance between these two logs. If you look at the, the error message, the first one says the term invoke Yoda is not recognized. The second one says the term dot slash invoke Yoda is not recognized. That is a really, really fascinating difference in looking at how PowerShell 3 or later uh, searches for commandlets before auto model, uh, like in the process of auto uh, module loading, that has some really interesting implications that I won't get into in this talk. Um, but again, this output information is going to be captured in the module logs. Um, so a as a defender, when you start to see these, uh, these samples of all these layers of encoding, and you realize, oh man, I found a bad thing, cool, let me unwrap it, oh man, I'm so smart, I know how to base64 decode, and then you unwrap it again, it's like, oh, I'm so smart, I know how to, base, or how to gzip decompress, and you unwrap it again, and you finally get to the last evil command, and you're like, yeah, this is bad. All right, that's, that's cool, it's a validating feeling to learn, you know, yesterday I didn't know how to do this, but today I do. However, when you have to do this a lot, and when your colleagues have to do this a lot, then instead of that joy you get when you're unwrapping, you just become like, like dead inside. Like the joy is no longer there. You realize, oh crap, I have to unwrap this. All right, just get me to the end. I wanna know what's happening with this payload. So what I'd say here is that this is where PowerShell logging can literally restore the joy of Christmas to defenders when it comes to having to analyze this stuff, right? Because in all the instances that we looked at in the wild, all the obfuscation, no matter how many layers of encoding, of compression, uh, of compression or obfuscation, they were eventually piped into invoke expression to literally be unwrapped in the engine. The same with this, with all the ASCII encoding. So what that means is that even for stuff that was hosted remotely, in this case with Empire, where even if the attackers already pulled the payload down, if it was piped into invoke expression, it's going to be sitting in PowerShell logging, which is really great. So in this case, going on the Star Wars Yoda theme, 
uh, I, I grabbed someone else's amazing Yoda ASCII art, and I gave them full credits here. I put it up on Pastebin, created a bit.ly link to then resolve to that Pastebin, just to get a kind of couple layers in between us. And then in an interactive PowerShell session, I do a download cradle, run invoke Yoda. You can see it runs the code. And then if we look at EID 4104 for script lock logging, we see the full remote payload that was executed simply because it was passed into IEX. So even if that payload does not exist in, in Pastebin anymore, we have the full content sitting in these logs. No matter how many layers of obfuscation, that's really cool. So with that, um, over the past couple years, uh, in a lot of my obfuscation research, I've developed a, a few frameworks to help automate obfuscation um, that I use to, to kind of uh, to, to develop detections uh, very, very quickly for this kind of stuff. And so these are a few of my tools we're going to chain together um, just to show how quickly obfuscation can occur for someone who can just click a few buttons, but also how PowerShell logging will, will handle this. So the, the first one is called Invoke Cradle Crafter. I can basically hand it a remote URL, which is going to be that bit.ly link to the Invoke Yoda stuff. I'm going to set a post cradle command, which means after you've invoked this, then run Invoke Yoda. And then we're just going to start exploring options. So these are all the remote download cradle options in the tool. Gives you some nice information about behaviors and artifacts and then we'll just automate that, and so that, that all becomes our obfuscated download cradle. The next tool we're going to jump in is invoke obfuscation, and we're going to actually feed it the output from the previous tool. Um, and then we're going to go into doing token obfuscation to turn it into something horrific like that, and then we'll go through another layer of encoding. In this case, we'll choose option two, which is hex encoding, um, and we'll encode it one more layer. So one more wrapping, and we're up to 4,244 characters. Um, so we'll copy that to the clipboard, jump into a PowerShell session and paste it in, and what we'll see is that it's going to properly download and execute that code after like three or four layers of unwrapping. But it doesn't matter how many layers it was, because at the end, the last thing passed into IEX, actually every layer passed into IEX is recorded, but the very last one's going to be the final payload. So that's sitting right there in the event logs. So one other thing, remember the example where we saw MSHTA and PowerShell being chained together? So it really doesn't matter even how PowerShell is launched. So let's take that first layer of obfuscated command and let's throw it in this other tool called invoke dosfuscation, which is an obfuscator uh, completely using command.exe. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to select a for code or for loop encoding option, which means that we have our obfuscated PowerShell input command. We're then going to wrap it into command.exe uh, for loop encoding, and we're going to handle uh, uh, we're going to handle PowerShell specific escaping underneath command level of escaping in this final um, payload that we'll get. So what you'll see is going to be a massive, disgusting, obfuscated array uh, of uh, integers that was going to represent uh, basically in memory a standard output reassembling this command. So if we copy this to the clipboard and open up a command prompt, then what we're going to see is just a whole wall of text as standard output as character by character is being reassembled in memory in command.exe. And at the very end, it's going to pass that to PowerShell. And PowerShell is going to invoke the very same command, which we see running right there. And once again, we can go back to uh, PowerShell logging uh, in the 4104 script block and see the final payload was captured. So those are just two examples to show that, that when it comes to like really gnarly obfuscation, uh, and even not gnarly obfuscation, but just the really common like wrapped layered stuff that we see in the wild that we see clients getting hit with all the time, is PowerShell logging can save you a lot of grief and also allow you to detect based at the deepest level of the, the unobfuscated content as opposed to having to try to detect every single layer. And remember how I said this talk is just about the defensive stuff in PowerShell? Well, if you looked at the preventative stuff at PowerShell as well, then half the stuff may not even run at all, which saves you a lot more work of cleanup. Um, so there definitely is quite an advantage to, to checking that out as well. So quick overview of those samples. We started just by inputting a URL and that invoke Yoda function. And the first uh, invoke Cradle Crafter gave us this output. We then passed in an invoke obfuscation, token obfuscation to get that. Passed it in one more time to get this massive hex encoding. And in the second example, we started with that first obfuscated command and threw it into dosfuscation and got this command.exe obfuscation like this. But it didn't matter how we launched it. It didn't matter how many layers of obfuscation. The final payload was still resolved in script lock logging in PowerShell. That's pretty neat. So if this is your environment and you have all this logging set up, then you should feel pretty darn good about yourself. Uh, not complacent, but pretty proud of, of what you've accomplished and what your team has accomplished because it's a really big deal. So novel detection approaches. Um, so uh, last year, uh, I uh, gave this talk here at uh, PSConf. It was about some research that Lee and I did uh, back in 2017 about using some different data science techniques and the power of the abstract syntax tree 
to, to basically, without any signatures being written, uh, detect obfuscated PowerShell code. That was a, a huge learning experience for me and a lot of fun. Um, another uh, approach, and this is a, a, a talk that I'll be giving on Thursday called PesterSec. It, it's kind of a hybrid of saying, let's use the power of the abstract syntax tree, but let's still write signatures, but based on like uh, not strings or patterns, but, but like numbers that don't make sense. And, what I'm, and, and this is really to detect things like minimal obfuscation that came about after our revoke obfuscation research. So I'll talk more about that on Thursday. But it's, it's applying like signatures to very specific elements or quantities or percentages of elements within PowerShell scripts. Um, the, the next one is uh, using module logs um, or the abstract syntax tree to basically group on commandlets uh, and then almost kind of fingerprint uh, anomalous scripts based on even just like counts or patterns of what commandlets are being used. So like, uh, for example here, uh, if I download invoke Mimi cats and I just tokenize it and I group on commands, then I can see that the most common commandlet run in invoke Mimi cats is out null, like 213 times. Well, that's actually kind of interesting. Um, you can see that it's in all these defined literals in the source code here. However, that's a super easy thing to change, so maybe I don't want to write a detection on that, but the next thing I'll look at is, okay, well, add member. There's 95 of those. Well, that's a lot. Now, if I'm doing static AST analysis, an attacker could go and take all those 95 instances and put it into a loop and technically, statically, only have one instance of app member. This is where the value of if you actually are able to run the code and then look at the modules that were executed, then you have a true count of what actually happened. However, that's only going to be the, the, the code path that ran as opposed to all the static code. So they're going to look slightly differently depending on how you get that um, initial data. The last one is, uh, is something that I've not heard talked about um, before, and it's actually a really subtle difference between um, EID 800 in the old PowerShell logs and 4103 in the new. And that is for module logs, it's going to say, hey, here's the command invocation. In this case, invoke expression is the command that ran. Um, and then it shows um, the, the, the part that it has that the newer PowerShell logs don't have is it's actually going to show this command line uh, information. It's going to show that in two spots. Now, this is interesting because, okay, invoke expression ran, and you can clearly see that came, that's the snippet of the command from which it came. Makes sense, right? Now, if an attacker in the top command, if they're running that IEX command, right, then the invocation is still going to be the full commandlet name, invoke expression, yet we don't see that in the command. But we can easily see, oh, well, we, we see it's alias, so that's fine. However, what I found to be very effective is what if an attacker uses a tick mark in IEX? Now, the command invocation is invoke expression, yet in the command line, in the code from whence it came, there is no instance of invoke expression nor any of its aliases. So now I'm calling shenanigans. Why did invoke expression run when I can't find any of its normal names in the command line? And if they do that crazy comspec stuff, it's an even more clear example of why was invoke expression running when I don't see any legitimate reason for it to have run in the, the command line. Now, there are plenty of opportunities for false positives with this approach, so it's not foolproof. But again, in your environment, it's actually quite an interesting place to start um, uh, if you have module logs uh, enabled. So, some key takeaways. I realize there's a lot of information. Um, and uh, I'm around all week, and so I'm really looking forward to saying hello and learning more from, from you all. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to hit me up. But in closing, what I'd say is that it, I don't really have to say it to this audience, but PowerShell is clearly powerful, and attackers recognize that as well. Um, and, uh, and so we have to be mindful of it specifically when, uh, as defenders. That being said, we have to also make sure that we're communicating it properly. Like, we have a responsibility for not being like, oh, yeah, like, like all these attacks here are using PowerShell. It's like, okay, well, a certain percentage of them are, but we have to remember a lot of the FUD, uh, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's being spread by saying there's these huge numbers in PowerShell attacks when a lot of them are just like stupid curl commands for executables, right? So we have to make sure we frame that context well because we, we talk to too many people that they say, oh, our CISO says we have to disable PowerShell or turn, it, you know, turn off PowerShell when um, they're really throwing the baby out with the bathwater. When it comes to offensive tradecraft, it's super diverse and super open. There's so much offensive tradecraft sitting out in GitHub that we see attackers using and modifying every single day. Um, and so it, it's important as defenders that we also look at these same tools and run them and play with them and test them to understand what new detection opportunities we might have. Um, and that also will allow us to discover the, the, many of the different forensic artifacts and detection um, uh, pieces of evidence that we can use to, to compose together the detection um, uh, methods and ideas. And when it comes to PowerShell, again, like, 
If, if you are the, the environment, if you are the organization that has all this stuff enabled, then I would love just to meet you and say, like, freaking good job, because I meet too few people that have that done. So if that's you, then the, the advantage that you have against the attackers when it comes to them ever stepping into PowerShell it, it is quite considerable. Um, and so, yeah, it, it gets me jazzed, because whenever we investigate attacks and someone actually has PowerShell logs enabled, it's like Christmas. Like, to have all that data, it's really, really, really awesome. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to uh, taking any questions. But again, thank you. There are 14 minutes between you and the next coffee break. So any questions? Yes. Can you say the last part again? Which event? So which events should we forward? Uh, excellent question. Yes. So the question is, is there any advice on which events you should forward from the PowerShell log? Presumably because there's so much, so much information. Yeah. So what I don't, I don't believe there's any official guidance. What I tell people first is module logs are going to be so much more information than script lock logs. And, and uh, PowerShell is already going to dedupe uh, unique script lock logs and just present the ID from the log that happened before. So I tell people to we'll start with script lock logs. Um, if you're in an environment that uses not much PowerShell natively, then that's actually going to be a, a pretty reasonable amount of information. If you use a lot of PowerShell, that could be a lot of information. Um, and so in that case, what we see some people do successfully is like, um, let's say they're using a sim that like Splunk or something, right? then what they're going to do is they're going to forward their logs to a syslog server, and at that point, they can do additional filtering if they want to, say, exclude these known script executions and then only forward uh, what's left. Or if you're doing, like, um, uh, like Windows event forwarding or something like that, perhaps you could push some of that down. Um, that becomes more of a maintenance uh, thing than anything else. Um, I, I, I know some people disagree with this guidance, but it, it, if you literally have not much to work with in terms of storing information, you could uh, forward script lock logs, the 4104s, and only look for those where the severity is warning level as opposed to informational. Um, th that would reduce the amount of information a little bit more. But there's definitely a malicious PowerShell that can run that will never trigger the warning level log, but it actually captures quite a lot of the, the common attack stuff that we see. So that's an excellent question. I don't know, does anyone else have any different guidance on that who's, who's maybe done smaller incremental like filtering of PowerShell logs? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Because especially if you're using a lot of PowerShell, I mean, it's, it's a ton of data. Assuming you live in our environment, we run BSC. So oh. then you already have, yeah. So, so, yeah, the, the question mainly came from, indeed, in our environment, we run BSC. Yeah. You already have all your tests running every 15 minutes. So, uh, yeah, we have 20 terabytes of logs stored for you. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, yeah it, it becomes unmanageable. And uh, yeah. that was indeed where my question came from. How do we properly filter that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's tough. That's not easy. I don't have an easy answer for that. But excellent question. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, right here. So we're using uh, Intune to deploy some packages to, to machines. To do that, we encrypt the message, encrypt the payload, uh, the PowerShell commands uh, to base64 to make it smaller, to, to fit into Intune. Is it possible to create a hash of a command, I mean, the full script log, and then um, use it in, in Defender ITP to, to filter out? I mean, the basic question is, is it possible to create a hash of a script log instead of a PowerShell.exe? So, I'm not following the last part. So, creating a hash. So, so what you're saying You've is that got you're. a huge command that's doing something, functions, calling in, calling out. So, a, uh -huh. a script block, yeah. basically, and create a hash of that. So, we can then tell our system to, okay, ignore every PowerShell command that has this hash. So, so almost to reference that code, to stop sending the code down, but just to reference the hash? Uh, I mean, I, I suppose you could have custom modules deployed. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm. I feel like in the group, in a room of PowerShell people, I'm missing a, <laughs> an obvious answer here. But what's that? So, so well, yeah, it's a good point. So, but are you saying you're wanting to actually whitelist uh, the the forwarding of those logs back to a centralized uh, 
like location, or is it a matter of you're wanting to push sensitive commands, but instead of pushing them all the time, just to send like a hash to say execute this known thing? You know, the, the thing is that we set the schedule task on each machine okay. that does some stuff mm -hmm. anyway, and Windows Defender ATP just uh, marks it as a suspicious command because it does a lot of stuff. Yeah. So we would like to get a hash of the full script log and say to ATP, just don't mark it, suppress the rule. We okay. know, we okay. know what we're doing. Just ignore this one. This one. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure the specifics there. I apologize. Yeah, just asking if but it's possible to create a hash of a full script log. Does anyone know the answer to that? <laughs> yeah, that, that 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 would be one approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure. I don't know. I'd be curious to talk more afterwards and, and, and brainstorm. I, I know the answer would exist in this room for sure. <laughs> but make the hash of the full set of what we're doing. But, but the, the hash being so that you can basically say, hey, don't analyze this, or like, or we're, we're doing potentially, we're doing normal stuff for us, but it could be detected as malicious, so I want to stop getting a thousand alerts. So some kind of alert suppression. Um, I, I suppose there may be, a, a, you know, in whatever uh, detection vendor or product you're using, maybe there's ways to whitelist that, but it could still be an issue if you're having all that forwarded from the endpoint. Um, but yeah, but, but even if the exact same code runs on two different systems, then the, the script block ID would be different, right? That's not, I think it's just going to be unique per system or, or across sessions or something like that. But signing of the code? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Man, these are good questions. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess it would depend on if, uh, if like, whatever detection engine you're using says, you know, uh, ignore or sign code. I see signed code like almost never when it comes to PowerShell, so that's... <laughs> I think that's also why we're using bypass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, def definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of variety. As being the obfuscation guy, my answer would be like just obfuscate it with token layer obfuscation and not much will detect it. Um, but it depends on what you're using because you may be using one that actually can detect it pretty easily. But, um, but, but if you want to talk about some, like, uh, some boutique obfuscation, then we, we can chat and I'll see what, what portions of it might be flagging as being obfuscated. And it's just a minimal obfuscation just for that. But that's kind of a hokey way to, uh, to run PowerShell in an enterprise. But, but. Excellent question. I'm gonna be, that's going to keep me awake at night. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so the question is, uh, WMI attacks, how much do we see that being used? Uh, quite a bit. Um, so the, uh, the, the crack map exec uh, tool, um, even the, in the slides it didn't show WMI, but that's typically run over WMI. Um, so that's the most common way that we see it, it being done, and you can monitor for that on the endpoint by looking at WMI PRVSE. Um, or getting into like the WMI operational logs, which I've almost never seen enabled. Um, but th there are definitely some more nuanced um, WMI, uh, more for like persistence. Um, so like WMI, like event consumers and stuff like that, um, or, or some really sharp attackers like storing entire payloads and results in like custom WMI properties, like actually in like the SIM repo. Um, so you can get pretty deep uh, with it forensically. Um, I know that um, there's some WMI uh, parsers um, that some of our reversers put out several years ago when we saw it being used in the wild. Um, I know Sysmon, like a couple editions ago, uh, has some updates for WMI, but I don't, I don't think it's the full gamut of, of the WMI attacks that we see, um, but that might have been updated since then, so I can't speak fully to that. But yeah, WMI is still probably the most common lateral movement technique that we see being used. So just because like uh, remotely scheduled um, uh, remote uh, service creation is, is being monitored a little better um, now than it used to be. But yeah, WMI is still pretty, uh, pretty prevalent. Excellent question. Yes.
Yeah, so the question is, is there any way to log what's happening with unmanaged PowerShell? So unmanaged PowerShell basically just being PowerShell so much deeper than just PowerShell.exe, but if you can have like, any process that's going to load system management automation DLL with the real guts of PowerShell, they, they can then you know, run unmanaged code. Uh, they can run PowerShell code without PowerShell.exe ever running. Um, so the, the answer is, is yes. Like, no, matter, no matter what the host application is that's, that's calling the underlying commands, it's still going to be logged um, in, in all the PowerShell logging we just talked about. The, the only exception to that would, is going to be the exact same exception for regular PowerShell.exe, which is uh, if the PowerShell 2 engine is used instead of the later ones, then the engine that's running doesn't have that visibility, like the hooks or capability into it. Um, and so it's typically what we'll call like a downgrade attack. So a lot of the unmanaged PowerShell frameworks will specifically uh, try to load up the old version of PowerShell, PowerShell 2 engine, if it's available. And in that case, then it's just the same as if you ran PowerShell dash v2, and you're not going to have that, that visibility into it. Um, well, one, I'm trying to think. Un, uh, I'm pretty sure that the unmanaged PowerShell wouldn't, uh, wouldn't store the user input in that console host, um, the read line console host history file. But I'm actually not 100% on that now that I say it out loud. I think that's, that's just a PowerShell.exe or, or PowerShell ISC um, like interactive usage. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the comment being, well, an attacker uh, could, could easily evade standard output, right? And so that's where it's important to remember that. So uh, let's say if they overwrite uh, uh, the standard output so that nothing is actually showing to the screen, but they're, they're piping it you know, over the wire um, to what, you know, what they own. Well, like, in that case, then, yeah, transcription logging is not going to be as helpful because you're not going to see the output. But then at that point, you could still go to module logging or script lock logging to see what commands are actually sent to then, uh, to then retrieve the results. Um, so like if they're doing a directory listing and then piping that out, yeah, we may never actually see uh, the output that is the directory listing, but we can look at the get child item command invocation and see all the items in the pipeline element now. Um, so there are kind of tips and tricks you can use to get around that. I don't think most attackers are really looking just to, uh, just to turn off standard output. They usually just try to turn off everything if they can, but even if they don't, they assume no one's going to see it or they're going to see it in a week when they're already long gone or they'll just delete the logs off the endpoint, because a lot of people don't forward event logs to a central location. But yeah, excellent question. Any other questions? Man, that's a lot of questions for like post-lunch. Any other questions? No? One? Um. I can, so the question is, do I have some, like, of these specific examples? Uh, I, I can put these examples into just uh, an example file. I'm trying to make sure, well. But I, need, I, I need to rethink some of the samples. I, I probably can't post all of them, uh, just because some are, are not something I would want <laughs> people running and saying I gave to them. But, but, but we can chat afterwards as well. I, I'll post some of the ones that are benign. A lot of these are going to be examples of obfuscation where it's not going to do anything unless you have the C2 server set up and all those communications. So the context is a little more to set up. But the, 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 the good thing, good or bad, depending on how you look at it, is that it's pretty easy to use the obfuscation frameworks we did at the end, which a lot of the in the wild stuff we see using obfuscation is just running it through those frameworks. Um, so any kind of uh, payloads that you want to play around with, then you can just run it through the framework in a couple seconds and get like obfuscated code, which is a really good way to kind of test your own detections to be like, hey, if it's obfuscated 10 layers this way, do we have anything that would A, prevent it, or B, detect it? And if so, at what layers are we doing both of those? Um, but, but yeah, let me think through and see what examples I can, uh, I can post up. I know in some of my other GitHub repos, I do have some samples um, just so people can take and use right off the bat to use for detection. Um, but let me rethink, rethink these. So, good question. One more, yes. I'm, I'm just thinking here. Uh, have you seen anyone doing uh, the overflow of the open source PowerShell with script logging disabled? That is a fantastic question. So, have, have, have I or have, have has my team ever seen anyone with a custom compiled version of PowerShell since it's open source? with script lock logging or some of those things uh, removed. I have never seen it, and I've talked to a lot of people who have insane visibility, and they've also never seen it. Um, 
which I think is kind of cool, because <laughs> uh, I imagine some people probably would think that's a real big risk to open source something like PowerShell, um, and that would probably be something they'd point to, but the reality is just not, not seen it, and it's not for lack of looking, but um, I don't know. Have you? <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very big problem. Yeah. Okay. So, so not the easiest undertaking. From someone that may have tried, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I'd be very curious. So, awesome. Well, uh, I'm available for questions around. I don't want to keep you all from coffee. But again, thank you so much for your time, and uh, look forward to saying hello. Thanks.